Last week I talked about, or we came to a place of repentance. And um, I want to continue that theme this morning. Because I believe that deep and true repentance is the foundation upon which God can move in His Spirit on a group of people. That if we will humble ourselves, that He will come and He will lift us up. And so the title for the message this morning is Submit Yourselves to God. Just kind of just like that. I want to read a passage of Scripture, James 4, starting in verse 7. It says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Father, I pray that this morning you will give us ears to hear what you're saying, what you're speaking to us individually and what you're speaking to our hearts and to our congregation, Lord, collectively. Lord, let the seed of your word sink deep in our hearts. And Lord, let it take root and grow and become strong in us. And Lord, as we apply your word to our lives, Father, I pray and invite your blessing to rest upon each and every person here. But Lord, I also pray that your kingdom would be advanced and extended in this community. Father, we desire to see you pour out a mighty move of your presence on this community, on Sarasota and Bradenton and Lakewood Ranch and Venice, Lord, and all the surrounding region and area. Lord, such a pouring out and such a revival, Lord, that it would have echoes that would go throughout the state of Florida and even this nation. Because, Lord, you are an awesome God, a mighty God. And, Lord, you deserve and desire to have a people that have humbled themselves and have called on your name. Lord, we turn from our wicked ways. That you would come and heal our land. We bless you this morning. We praise you. We acknowledge you. We do not take your presence, Lord, for granted. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said last week, we had a time of repentance after the message. And that theme continued. Pastor Kent uh, led us at at 6 o'clock that evening in a congregational meeting. And that was the theme. We had people up here all across the front that that repented. And and his challenge and and call was to repent of something uh, that you sense personally you need to repent of or something that the church needs to repent of. And what was interesting is that, you know, he gave us an out. He said, well, you can repent of something that the church needs to repent of, which is, you know, that's not real uh, personal. But the vast majority of people repented in the sense of of confessing something that was personal to them. And they said, Lord, please forgive me. We repent. I repent. From that, we moved into a congregational meeting. And I believe God is calling us to submit to some things that he is placing in front of us. To intentionally submit to God's order. And I believe that means a couple of things. One is being intentional about being a sending congregation. We've been talking about that. How many of you know that your mission is not here on Sunday morning? That your mission is out there. It's in the people that you meet. It's the places that you go. It's being that salt and that light that God intends for his people to be. It's about being intentional about evangelism. About being willing to share the good news that has changed and transformed your life with someone else. Because they need what you have, and what you have is Jesus. And the third thing we talked about was raising up apostolic leadership. And what that essentially means when you boil it all down is we're going to be separating my role into two roles. To date, Pastor Kent has been functioning as an assistant. And I believe it's time to bring him to the fore as what I would call a congregational pastor. How many of you remember the, the, the sermon that I did with the evangelist and the, the pastor and the, you know, the evangelist dropped the baby and, and the, the apostle threw the baby? Remember that? How many of you were here for that? All right, well, the rest of you missed it. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, I, I've been kind of functioning as, as the pastor 
And, and what we're moving into is, is really beginning to see the five-fold functions and those things begin to take shape. And, 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 and where I, I'm more of an apostolic elder, and Pastor Kent is more of a pastoral elder. That's who he is. And so we're separating my role out. I'm, I'm not going anywhere, okay? I just want you to know that. You're stuck with me. But... Um, but, but, but I'm going to continue to be the primary speaker. I'll continue to give leadership to the congregation. But Pastor Kent is going to become the pastor. He's going to be responsible for the ministries and the, the various things. He's going to be responsible to make sure you're cared for. Amen? Because that's what he's doing anyway. I mean, you know, that's it. But we're just simply recognizing what God is already doing. That's the best way to raise up leadership. I'm a firm believer in, in bringing up, raising up leaders from within because leaders, people that are within the congregation and have been for a while, begin to have our DNA. They begin to understand the value of relationship and the depth of community that we desire to experience. And so we talked about that in that meeting. This morning, I want to call us to submit. James tells us here in this passage to submit to God. And submit literally means to yield, resign, or surrender to the power, the will, or authority of another. And in this case, James is telling us to submit ourselves to God. To yield to His ways. How many of you know that your ways aren't necessarily His ways? See, sometimes what we do is we want to do what we want to do and then put God's stamp on it. And we can't do that because what we're really doing is we're just saying, God, I'm going to do what I want to do. No matter what you think or want, I'm going to do what I want to do. God, I just want you to bless it. Who's in control in that scenario? We are. And part of the essence of the Christian life is surrendering ourselves under the Lordship of God. It's saying, God, it's not any longer what I want. It's, 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 it's not what I want to do. It's not who I think I am or what I need to validate myself. But, Lord, I want to be found in you. I want to be doing what you want me to do. And whether that's out in the open or whether that's hidden, it doesn't really matter because obedience brings about the blessing of God on our lives. And we find our peace there. And so James says, submit yourself to God. Resign yourself to following His instructions. Resign yourself to say, you know what, Lord? It's not what I want anymore, but it's what you want. It's not who I want to talk to anymore, Lord, but it's who you want me to talk to. It's not where I want to work anymore, Lord, but it's where you want me to work. And many times where he wants us to work is where we would desire to work. He places that within us. But sometimes he's saying, you know what was good in this season is no longer my best for you. And he says, you know, I know this was good and I even called you there, but now it's time to move beyond where I used to have you and I want you to move into what I have for you in the future. And if we're comfortable where we are, if we like where we are, you know, we've made friends finally with the people that are around us. We don't like this. And sometimes we say, well, no, Lord, I just want to stay where I am. And our communion with God effectively stops at that point. He's still God. We're still saved. But we're not open to the blessing that he has. We're not submitted any longer to his ways. The desire here, what James is saying is surrender your life. Give it up for the Lord. See, he's greater than we are. And you need to understand that, that he is greater than we are. It's, it's not like, you know, we're just kind of, well, okay, I need God, so I need God, and, and now I'm just going to go about my business. No, he is greater than we are. You know why he's greater than we are? Because he created you. The, the, the creator is always greater than the creation. Do you understand that this morning? That we have the responsibility to submit ourselves and humble ourselves before God. Because he's greater than we are. He's much wiser than I am, than you are. He's, he's, much more, he's got much more, many more resources than you or I. He's far beyond us. And this understanding has to be settled in our minds. It's not to place any less value on us as people. It's simply to place greater value on who God is and what he has for us. 
So he is greater, and this has to be settled. See, submission is something we must be intentional about. None of us naturally submit. What's the first word that your child said, more than likely? It was either mama or no. And probably it was no. We learn really, really early to say no. And that's just in us. We do not want to submit. There's something that rises up inside of us that when somebody tells us what to do, we just say, uh-uh. You talking to me? I ain't doing that. And it may be something wonderful. Hey, I have some cake. You got to eat this. Uh-uh. Not me. I like cake. Have you, ever, have you ever said no to something that when you start thinking about it, you say, why did I say no to that? What is that? Well, that's just kind of in us. We, we do not naturally submit. But we must make conscious and consistent decisions to place ourselves under God's authority, under his will, under his power. Because that's the way his power flows. It flows from him through us, through a submitted, a dedicated, a sanctified, a set-apart vessel, you and I. And this decision finds its practical application in how we live our lives. It comes out. Are we submitted to God? It comes out in our actions. We repent when God brings conviction into our lives. And we stop sinful behaviors. Too often we make peace with our sinful behaviors. And there's teaching in the church today that basically says you don't even need to confess your sins anymore. It all happened at the cross. And it's like, you know what? I think that's a very dangerous kind of theology. Yes, all of our sin is under the cross, but you know what? We have a responsibility too. We have to say, Lord, forgive me because I, I, I messed it up. And the Lord is faithful and just, the Bible says, to forgive and to cleanse. But the requirement of the forgiveness and the cleansing is to confess our sins. All biblical. See, something happens when you and I actually verbalize the very thing that God wants to pull out of us. It's like we're allowing him to pull it out and it comes out through our mouth and all of a sudden now it's out there. And you may confess your sin to God alone, but it's in the air. And it's like, okay, wait a minute, I'm just going to take care of this. But it's not just about repenting and submitting to the things that God wants to take out of our lives for our benefit, by the way. But it's about submitting to the things that God wants us to do. It's about witnessing as he wants us to witness. It's about worshiping and coming into his presence. It's about prayer. It's about serving. There may be many things that God would have us to be about. And he's basically saying, when you submit to me, you are submitting to a way of life that will bring you blessing and contentment and grace. And it will bring you good things if you will submit to me. We speak. As God would have us to speak, we submit to his word. God may tell you to go talk to somebody. We have a choice. Are we going to submit to God? Or are we going to simply continue to walk in fear or in laziness or whatever it is? But it's not just actions, it's attitudes. When we submit to God, I believe God wants us to put on joy. How many of you got up this morning with joy? What did the rest of you get up with? <laughs> now, let me qualify that. How many of you got up with joy and coffee? Okay, a few more hands went up. The rest of you need some more coffee or something, okay? I mean, you know, there, there are those people that get up and they, 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 boom, their eyes open, they're up. They're dancing around the bed. I mean, you know, they're good morning, good morning. Yeah, they're brushing their teeth. And their spouse is laying in bed because they don't have that gift. And they're just like, oh, just stop it. There are some people that don't wake up until the second cup of coffee hits. And even then it's questionable. You know, that's just part of who we are. But, you know, I believe that we can choose our attitudes. 
You can choose to be positive or negative. Same circumstances hit the same people. And one person chooses, you know what, I am going to, to be positive about this. I'm going to see the good. And another person, they can, there can be 99 things that are right about the situation and one thing that's wrong, and they'll pick up on the one wrong thing. Don't be that person. Just don't do that. It's not worth it. See, God, would, God wants us to see our circumstances in a positive light. And it's not just a positive thinking light. It's positive because he would desire that we walk by faith. And not simply by what we see. It's a, it's a desire to say, my God is able. Circumstances, they're the same. I don't particularly like the circumstances, but I believe that God is able to interrupt and intercede in my circumstances and make it different than what it is. Because our God is able. So what's your attitude? Do you have an attitude of faith? Or do you simply have an attitude of fear? Or an attitude of, well, I don't think it's for me. I mean, you know, we, we speak forth a lot of truth that we don't even realize that we're simply self-fulfilling. I believe God would have us to walk in an attitude where we live in an awareness that we're on assignment and actively seek, seek opportunities to minister. We had our apostolic meetings this past week, and uh, we were in North Georgia, and it was, it was really a good time. Um, I mean, I, I've talked to a number of different people, and one of the things, it was, it, there was peace there. And there's, there's, they're all good, but it's like it was a time of refreshment, a time of peace, and, and people were ministered to. And we got back on Friday, and we hadn't seen our sons, and, um, and so we wanted to go out to, for dinner. And, um, and, and so we went, and, um, and we went to, to a restaurant, um, and, and we, were, we, we had to put our name in and wait. You ever wait at a restaurant? And this particular restaurant was very busy. I mean, there were people standing in the lobby, and there were seats around the, the edge. And we were on a corner, and, and, and I was sitting on the corner, and, and my son, one son was sitting here, and then Nancy was over here, and, and the other son was sitting on the other side of her. And, and, and we were sitting there, and this couple sat down, and um, he was probably, I don't know, 80 Ish. He, he had one of these oxygen tanks, you know, that, that go up through. And, uh, and, and, and you could just tell, I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he was fine. In fact, he asked about the bracelet. We, one of the, I forget who was, had the bracelet on their, their arm. It said Galatians and had a little chit-chat. Well, anyway, so we're sitting there. What do you do in a, in a room full of people? And, and you know, it's loud and everything. And, and so I, I look over at my son. And my son, it was Daniel. And, you know, we're not paying attention. We're just bored. We're ready to eat. And I see him begin to engage this gentleman in conversation. And then I, I see him lean over, kind of like, and talk into his ear. And, and, and the, the man responds back, and, and, and he, 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 he nodded his head. And then, it just very naturally, Daniel took his hand, put it on his shoulder, and he prayed for him. It took about 20 seconds. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, because I'm bored, I'm watching this. I shouldn't have been listening to the conversation, but, you know, it's like, and, and, and Nancy didn't even know it was anything, nothing, nobody knew anything was going on. And after 20 seconds, it just, you know, it was done. And, uh, and a little bit, just a minute or two later, the man, they, they called the, the name of the, the, this particular couple, and they got up and they walked off. And I, I just thought about it, you know, that was easy. Come to find out the man had cancer and, you know, he was in, in had health issues and just different things. But how many times do we not realize, perhaps, in the situation that we're in, that God has an opportunity and an assignment for us to minister into? And it can be very simple. Nobody else in that room knew what was going on except for those two people, that, the gentleman and Daniel and me and God. And everybody else was into themselves, and that's fine. We have to live in a, with an attitude of an awareness to submit to God in the everyday situations and circumstances that we find ourselves. See, I believe what James is saying here, if we're not intentional about submitting to God, we will not have the power to resist the devil. We can pray. You can decree. 
You can declare all that you want, but the devil, and I want you to hear it now, you, the devil will not flee from you if you're not first submitted to God. It's not about you speaking something just because you have the authority to speak it. The authority comes from the foundation of Jesus in your life. And that foundation comes from your submission to him. And so just because you speak the word, you wonder, well, well why, why, why isn't anything happening? Maybe it's because you're really not submitted to God. You just want God to do what you want to do so that you can continue to do what you want to do. Rather than submit yourself to God, find yourself in him, do things the way he wants them done, go where he would have you to go, do what he would have you to do. When you, you can submit to God in one area of your life, and you can find victory in that area. You can find victory. You can find freedom. But sometimes you cannot submit to God in another area of your life, and you're defeated. That's why you can find people that are believers and they're sincere and they're true and they're submitted in the sense that they are walking with the Lord and yet there's a glaring thing in their life that if you were really uncovered, you'd say, wait a minute, that doesn't connect. It's like they're walking with God here and they're not walking with God here. And the scripture says this talks about being double-minded. What's happening? There's an area of your life or that person's life that is not submitted. See, when we, re when we submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee. Because at that point, the enemy knows that we're serious. When there's nothing that we're holding back, nothing that we have said is off limits. Everything in our lives is said, okay, God, whatever you want, here it is. Wherever you would have me to go, here it is. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, Lord, here it is. And we fully submit everything in our lives to God. God says, okay, now I stand behind you because you're mine. And because now when you resist the devil, he has to flee from you. The enemy knows we're serious. And I believe this works personally. It works as a congregation. See, what God really wants is for us to submit to his invitation to relationship. James says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The whole idea of submission is not first and foremost about your behavior. It's about relationship. It's about your heart. It's about walking with God. And your behavior, when you walk with God and submit to him, your behavior will follow. Your behavior will begin to work itself out because God says, I'm taking responsibility for that. Now, I'm going to see that that works itself out. And he'll make the thing that you're attracted to unattractive. He'll make the thing that you think you want, you just won't want it anymore. Or the thing that used to bring you pleasure, now you just kind of turns you off. Why? Because you've submitted that to God. You've got serious about walking with him. And instead of just simply not wanting to do these things, you begin to find yourself doing the things that draw you near to God. And this other begins to fade. It's about intentionally drawing near. And James gives us a pattern to do this. He says, cleanse your hands. That literally basically means confess your sin. Because sin separates us from God. He says, purify your hearts. Make God your one thing. The relationship that is most important to you. How many of us have placed and made God the single priority in our life? And then said, okay, God, there's these, all these other things. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things, what? will be added unto you. He already knows that you need them. Make him the priority. How many of you have done that? See, in our culture, in our Western society, you know, we've made other things. Many of us have placed other things as a priority. What is your priorities? Is TV a priority? Opposed to God? Is working out a priority as opposed to God? Is eating a priority as opposed to God? Is finding your own personal validation a priority as opposed to walking with God? 
See, in our culture, we don't have totem poles with idols on them. We don't have these wooden heads that somebody carved into, a face into. That's not the kind of idols that we have. We have much more subtle idols. And those idols are what need to be dethroned and brought into their proper place underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not a time to feast. It's not a time to party. It's a time to be sober, James says. It's a time to, to understand the times in which we live and that this is a time when we must be sober and take an assessment of what our lives is, 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 is made of. It's a time to assess your life and to say, these are the things that I can no longer do because God would have me go and do something different. These are the attitudes that I can no longer hold on to because God has something so much better for me. See, what God is really looking for here is humility. A bowing of our heads to Him. A bending of our knee to Him. Creating intentional patterns of submission to Him. Making our relationship with Him the priority. And adopting his purposes for our lives as his own. You know, we talk about the ways of God. And how many times do we can compare his ways with our ways? And we hang on to our ways because his ways we just don't quite understand. You know, one of the things... That, uh, that, that this, and this is strange, I admit, but I like to do is I like to cut watermelon. How many of you like watermelon? When you cut your watermelon, how do you cut it? Do you cut it and leave the rind on? Why do you do that? There's a better way. You take the watermelon, you cut both ends off, you cut it in half, okay? And then you flip it up, and then you just peel the rind off. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just go right around. And you're left with a chunk of watermelon. <sighs> it takes less time. It's easier to eat than doing it the way I grew up doing it, which was, you know, you, you, you get the little, little, little triangle things, and you have to eat it off, and then you have the rind to deal with. And, you know, it's messy. and it's, it, well, Don't, you know, let me teach you. If you want to do your watermelon the old way, do it. But there's a better way. You can get a whole bowl of chunks. I mean, you know, sit with a fork. It's, it's great. But, you know, many times God's ways are just like that. It's like you have done something the same way your entire life. And God comes along and says, I want you to do something differently. And because his ways are not familiar ways, we reject it. And we say, I'm good. I'll just keep doing it the old way. See, adopting his purpose as our purpose, adopting his ways as our ways, everything else then becomes subordinate to him. Everything else finds its place underneath his lordship. See, ultimately, submission is a place of freedom. Because when you submit to God, you're not responsible then. If he leads you into things, you're simply saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, this is what you called me to do. Okay, God, you called me to do this. Now it's up to you to provide. It's up to you to go ahead of me. Lord, I, I'm being obedient. You're going to have to prepare and, and, and minister. And then we find peace in that. You know, and God puts us in situations where we practice. We don't learn submission necessarily by saying submit to God. We learn submission by submitting at our workplace. We learn submission by submitting in our home. We learn submission in, in, in ways that are tangible. That's not saying if somebody wants you to sin, no, don't do that. But we really get at the heart of why we react against submission in our natural relationships which prepare us to submit to God in a spiritual relationship. We find freedom there. And when we yield our lives to him and we say, Lord, whatever you have for me is fine, 
that is when we become his partners. And he can do some extraordinary things through most of us that are just ordinary people. James goes on to say that when we humble ourselves, he will lift us up. Our submission allows God to go ahead of us. He orders our steps. He prepares our way. And he leads us into the experiences that shape our lives. See, God is building us into something. Do you realize that you're building material? It says in, let me read this. It says in, in, in 1 Peter 2 that coming to him, Christ, as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, you and I, we've come to Jesus this morning. And he receives us. But what he begins to do is shape us. To place us in the role, in the function, the position that he would have us so that we can operate as a body. In my life before ministry, uh, I was a mason. And I used to do stonework. And I really like doing fireplaces, but one of the things that we did was um, the, the, my favorite kind of, of work was, was doing a fireplace and, and like an interior kind of thing. And we would go down to a dry riverbed. Okay, you don't have, we don't have these in Florida, I don't think, not like this. And, and, and there's rocks on the riverbed because they're dry. And some of them are big rocks and, you know, some of them are, are smaller rocks. But if you take a couple of, of sledgehammers, there's a certain kind of sledgehammer that you need for this, and, and you, 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 you hit this, the, these rocks, they'll they'll uh, crack open. And inside, it's, it's just really pretty. It's beautiful. It's, there's purples and reds and yellows. And we would take these, and, and it was sandstone, and we would take these and take them to the job site, and we would build a fireplace with them. Now, the only problem was rocks don't naturally fit together. And you as living stones don't naturally fit together. And so I would have to take a hammer and a chisel and shape each rock to fit in the hole that it needed to fit into. And once you did that, then you had all your joints. They were nice. They were even. And it was beautiful. But you see, we're in a process of submitting to God and submitting to his chisel to allowing him to trim off of us the things that are keeping us from our function and our destiny. Because when we submit to the chisel, if you will, when we submit to God's molding and shaping, that's maybe a nicer way to say it, we find contentment and peace and blessing and grace and prosperity because we're submitted. We have to submit to his authority to build us into his spiritual house. And that's what I pray that we can see this morning, that it's about me and my personal walk with the Lord, submitting those things that are not of him. But it's also about submitting to the place and the people that he has me in so that we together can function as a part of the body of Christ, as a part of the bride of Christ. It's going to happen. One way or another, we are going to, to find relationship with each other. We're going to be fit together. And so the invitation this morning is very simple. What is his purpose for you that he's calling you to submit to? What are those actions that he is asking you to lay down so that you can submit to his ways? It's not about looking at other people and saying, well, this person needs to do this. Some of you hear a message like this and you're probably elbowing your spouse saying, are you listening? But it's about looking at yourself, assessing your life, saying, okay, Lord, what do I need to lay down? Make that change necessary. What are those unsubmitted areas of your life that God is asking you to submit to his lordship. Let's stand together. This morning, I just, I have a sense that there's some people that last week 
you, you kind of halfway did this. And God is calling us to a deep level of repentance. A level of repentance that allows him to sanctify us and set us apart for his purpose. And I fully believe that part of his purpose is to pour his presence, his spirit out on us in a very special, deep, dynamic way. Not just so that we are blessed, but so that we can change the circumstances, the situation, so that we can change the city around us. So that we can see people come to him and that we can be prepared and ready to disciple them and minister to them. To submit our time to him. To submit our speech to him. To submit our actions to him. To submit our attitudes to him. This morning, if you know, if, even if I've spoken and you know that there's an area of your life that you're saying, okay, God, and you're ready to say, I give up. I want you to come to the altar this morning. Someone will come and pray with you. We've all been there. The vast majority of us in this room have been to the altar at one time or another. This is a safe place to come and simply do business with God. To say yes to the Lord. As we worship, the Bible says that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. It's not just about singing songs. It's about our heart connecting with his heart and his presence comes. Psalm 22, 3. And, and as he inhabits, he's enthroned. He comes, he sits, and there's a, a manifestation that begins to happen as people repent and lay down their lives and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Do you have the courage? Do you have the courage to actually submit yourself to God? Are you content with what is currently in your life? And you're just going to kind of get off the train and say, I don't want to go anymore. Because God has so much more, so many better things that he has for you. But it's going to require the surrender of your life, the surrender of those things, so that he can bring in what he has. Your ideas, your opinions. This is happening in our network right now. It's, it's very exciting. It can be a little scary, but there's transition happening. There's things that are that God is speaking to people. And, and, and it's not that they've been in the wrong place. It's just that God now has another place, another function, a greater, a greater thing that he has for, for people to do. And I believe that he's readying us. He's positioning us so that we can take our place in that great fireplace that he's building. All of us fit together, living stones, a spiritual sacrifice, a spiritual house unto our God. Father, I pray this morning that you'll be very clear. Holy Spirit, I release you to move and to minister among us that you would have your way this morning. We release you to move. We release you to worship or to, to work. And we worship you in Jesus' name. Let's worship together. I invite you to respond.